In the shadowy underbelly of New York City, where ambition collides with cruelty and the American dream takes on a sinister hue, one name stands above all others. Charles Lucky Luciano. This is the story of a Sicilian immigrant who rose from the teeming tenements of the Lower East Side to become the architect of modern organized crime in America. Born Salvatore Lucania in 1897, he would transform into Charlie Lucky Luciano, a man whose cunning, charisma, and cold-blooded determination would forever reshape the criminal landscape. From his humble beginnings, as a street tough to his reign, as the undisputed boss of bosses, Luciano's life reads like a Shakespearean tragedy played out on the mean streets of the Big Apple. But Luciano's story is more than just a tale of one man's rise to power. It is a mirror reflecting the dark side of the American dream, a cautionary tale of unchecked ambition and the corrupting influence of power. Through his creation of the Commission and the infamous Five Families, Luciano would leave an indelible mark on the world of organized crime that continues to resonate today. Join us as we delve into the life of Lucky Luciano, from his meteoric rise to his dramatic fall and exile. Witness the birth of modern organized crime, the bloody feuds that shaped it, and the relentless pursuit of justice that would ultimately bring down one of the most powerful criminal empires in history. This is the story of Lucky Luciano, the man who changed the face of the American underworld forever. Chapter 1. The Sicilian Immigrant. A New World Awaits. The year was 1897, and in the small Sicilian town of Lucara Fridi, a baby boy named Salvatore Lucania took his first breath. Born into a family of modest means, Salvatore's early years were marked by the hardships and uncertainties that plagued many Italians in the late 19th century. His father, Antonio, toiled as a sharecropper, eking out a meager living from the sun-baked soil, while his mother, Rosalia, kept the household running with unwavering determination. As Salvatore grew, he witnessed firsthand the daily struggles that defined life in rural Sicily. The constant threat of crop failure, the lack of economic opportunity, and the looming shadow of poverty that hovered over his family and their neighbors. It was a world where the promise of a better life often felt like a distant dream, a mirage that beckoned from across the vast, unforgiving ocean. One day, as Salvatore played in the dusty streets of Lercara Fridi, his parents gathered the family and delivered news that would forever alter the course of his life. They had decided to take the plunge and immigrate to the United States, the land of opportunity that had captured the imagination of so many Italians seeking a fresh start. The decision was not an easy one, for it meant leaving behind the familiar comforts of their home and venturing into the unknown. But the lure of a better future, one free from the constant struggle for survival, was too strong to ignore. With a mix of excitement and trepidation, the Lucania family began the arduous preparations for their transatlantic journey. In the spring of 1906, Salvatore, now a curious and wide-eyed nine-year-old, found himself aboard a steamship bound for the bustling metropolis of New York City. As the ship cut through the choppy waters of the Atlantic, the young boy gazed out at the horizon, his heart racing with a mix of anticipation and anxiety. What would this new land hold for him and his family? After a grueling two-week voyage, the Lucania family finally set foot on American soil, disembarking at the crowded docks of Ellis Island. Salvatore's senses were immediately overwhelmed by the cacophony of voices, the pungent smells, and the sheer scale of the towering buildings that seemed to stretch endlessly into the sky. As the family was processed through the immigration station, Salvatore marveled at the diversity of the crowd around him, people from all corners of the world, each with their own story, their own dreams, all seeking a chance at a better life. The experience was both exhilarating and unsettling, a glimpse into the vast melting pot that was the United States. With their paperwork completed, the Lucanias were released into the bustling streets of New York City, 
their final destination being the crowded, impoverished neighborhood of the Lower East Side. It was here, amidst the cramped tenement buildings and the constant hum of activity, that Salvatore would take his first steps into his new life as an American immigrant. The sights, sounds, and smells of the Lower East Side were a far cry from the rural tranquility of Lircara Fridi. Salvatore's eyes widened as he navigated the narrow cobblestone streets, dodging horse, drawn carriages, and the occasional automobile. The air was thick with the scents of freshly baked bread, sizzling street food, and the pungent odor of horse manure, a sensory overload for the young boy. As the family settled into their cramped, poorly ventilated tenement apartment, Salvatore quickly learned that the American dream did not come without its challenges. The Lucanius shared a single room with another family, and the constant noise and lack of privacy were a far cry from the relative solitude of their Sicilian home. Salvatore's parents, once proud and self-reliant, now found themselves struggling to make ends meet, relying on odd jobs and the generosity of their fellow immigrants to survive. For young Salvatore, the transition to this new life was not an easy one. He missed the familiar sights and sounds of his hometown, the carefree days spent playing in the fields, and the strong sense of community that had defined his childhood. In the crowded, bustling streets of the Lower East Side, he felt lost and overwhelmed, a stranger in a strange land. Yet, even amidst the hardships, Salvatore could not help but be captivated by the energy and dynamism of his new surroundings. The streets teemed with life, a vibrant tapestry of diverse cultures and traditions. Salvatore watched in fascination as his neighbors bargained with street vendors, their voices rising and falling in a rhythmic dance. He marveled at the towering skyscrapers that seemed to touch the sky, a far cry from the modest homes of Lercara Fridi. As Salvatore adjusted to his new environment, he began to explore the neighborhood, venturing out beyond the confines of his family's cramped apartment. It was during these early forays that he encountered the first signs of the criminal underworld that would one day come to define his life. He witnessed the activities of street gangs, the occasional scuffle, and the hushed whispers of illicit activities that took place behind closed doors. At first, Salvatore was wary of these unsavory elements, preferring to keep his distance. But as he grew older and the pressures of poverty and marginalization began to weigh on him, the allure of the criminal life became increasingly difficult to ignore. The promise of power, wealth, and a sense of belonging in this new, often hostile environment was a siren's call that would eventually lead Salvatore down a path from which there would be no turning back. The young Sicilian immigrant's journey had only just begun, and the streets of New York City were about to become the proving ground for a boy who would one day rise to become one of the most powerful and notorious figures in the history of organized crime. Chapter 2. The Education of a Criminal As Salvatore Lucania, the young Sicilian immigrant, navigated the crowded streets of New York's Lower East Side, he quickly learned that survival often meant embracing the harsh realities of the criminal underworld. Chaotic energy of the bustling neighborhood, coupled with the scarcity of legitimate opportunities, pushed Salvatore and countless others, like him, towards a life of petty crime and gang activity. It was during his teenage years that Salvatore, now known by his street name Lucky Luciano, began his formal education in the ways of organized crime. Drawn to the power and prestige that came with membership in a gang, he forged his first criminal alliances, honing his skills and building a reputation as a ruthless and cunning operator. One of Luciano's earliest and most influential encounters was with Frank Costello, a fellow Sicilian immigrant who had already carved out a niche for himself in the underworld. Costello, with his sharp business acumen and connections, recognized the young Luciano's potential and took him under his wing, introducing him to the intricate web of criminal enterprises 
that thrived in the shadows of the city. Through Costello, Luciano also met Meyer Lansky, a Russian Jewish immigrant who shared Luciano's entrepreneurial spirit and appetite for risk. The three young men, each with their own unique skills and backgrounds, formed an unlikely alliance that would shape the future of organized crime in America. As prohibition swept the nation in the 1920s, the opportunities for criminal enterprises expanded exponentially. Luciano, Costello, and Lansky quickly capitalized on the growing demand for illegal liquor, establishing a network of speakeasies and smuggling operations that generated substantial profits. With their combined resources and strategic thinking, they outmaneuvered rival gangs and established families, solidifying their hold on the criminal landscape. Luciano's rise within the ranks of the underworld was marked by his ruthless ambition and his willingness to eliminate anyone who stood in his way. He orchestrated the assassinations of Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano, too powerful Maranzano, too powerful Maranzano, two powerful mafia bosses who represented the old guard. This bold move not only eliminated his competition, but also paved the way for Luciano to implement his vision for a more streamlined and efficient criminal enterprise. The impact of World War I on New York's criminal landscape also played a significant role in Luciano's ascent. The disruption caused by the war, coupled with the influx of returning soldiers, and the growing popularity of illegal gambling and vice created a perfect storm for enterprising individuals like Luciano to thrive. He was quick to adapt to the changing conditions, diversifying his criminal portfolio and expanding his reach into new rackets, including prostitution and loan sharking. As Luciano's power and influence grew, so too did his reputation. He was known for his shrewd business acumen, his ability to navigate the complex web of criminal alliances and his ruthless willingness to eliminate anyone who threatened his interests. His lucky nickname, which he had acquired in his youth, only added to the mystique that surrounded him, further cementing his status as a formidable figure in the underworld. However, Luciano's rise was not without its challenges. The increasing scrutiny from law enforcement and the growing tensions between the old guard and the younger generation of criminals posed significant threats to his burgeoning empire. Luciano recognized the need to adapt and innovate, and it was during this period that he began to formulate his vision for a more organized and efficient criminal enterprise. The stage was now set for Luciano to make his mark on the world of organized crime a journey that would ultimately transform the landscape of the American Mafia and leave an indelible legacy that would be felt for generations to come. Chapter 3. The Roaring Twenties – Bootlegger's Paradise The advent of Prohibition in 1920 ushered in a new era of opportunity for Lucky Luciano and his criminal associates. With the sale and consumption of alcohol outlawed, a lucrative black market emerged, and lucrative black market emerged, and Luciano was quick to capitalize on it. Leveraging his growing network of connections and his knack for strategic thinking, he expanded his bootlegging operations, establishing a vast network of speakeasies and smuggling routes that stretched across the city. Luciano's rise to power during the Roaring Twenties was fueled by his ability to adapt and innovate. While the old guard mafia families clung to their traditional methods, Luciano recognized the need for a more organized and efficient criminal enterprise. He forged alliances with like-minded individuals, including his longtime friend and business partner, Mayor Lansky, as well as the influential Frank Costello. Together, they built a formidable criminal empire, with Luciano overseeing the importation and distribution of illicit alcohol. The speakeasies they controlled became hubs of illicit activity, offering not just bootleg liquor but also gambling, prostitution, and other lucrative rackets. Luciano's attention to detail and ruthless efficiency allowed him to outmaneuver his rivals, who struggled to keep up with the young upstart's rapid expansion. However, Luciano's rise to power was not without its challenges. 
Conflicts with rival gangs and established mafia families were inevitable, and Luciano proved himself adept at navigating these treacherous waters. He carefully cultivated relationships with corrupt politicians and law enforcement officials, ensuring that his operations were shielded from scrutiny and interference. One of Luciano's most significant challenges came from the old guard mafia bosses who viewed him and his associates as upstarts seeking to usurp their power. The tension between the Young Turks and the Mustache Peets, as they were known, came to a head in a bloody conflict that would ultimately shape the future of organized crime in America. Luciano's strategic mind and ruthless determination were on full display as he orchestrated the assassinations of two of the most powerful mafia bosses of the era, Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. These bold moves not only eliminated his rivals, but also paved the way for Luciano to consolidate his power and implement his vision for a more organized criminal enterprise. The elimination of Masseria and Maranzano marked a pivotal moment in Luciano's rise to power. With his enemies vanquished, he set about restructuring the Mafia, creating the Commission, a governing body that would oversee the activities of the various criminal organizations operating in the city. This move, along with the establishment of the Five Family System, would have a lasting impact on the structure of organized crime in America. Luciano's ability to adapt and innovate set him apart from his contemporaries. While the old guard mafia bosses clung to their traditional methods, Luciano embraced a more corporate-like approach to criminal operations. He implemented efficient systems for the importation, distribution, and sale of bootleg liquor, as well as diversifying into other lucrative rackets, such as gambling and loan sharking. This organizational prowess combined with Luciano's ruthless ambition, allowed him to expand his empire rapidly. By the late 1920s, he had become a dominant figure in the New York underworld, commanding respect and fear from his peers and subordinates alike. The lucky moniker that had followed him since his youth seemed increasingly fitting as he navigated the treacherous world of organized crime. However, Luciano's rise to power was not without its costs. The violence and bloodshed that accompanied his ascent left a trail of victims in his wake and the growing scrutiny from law enforcement agencies threatened to undermine his carefully constructed empire. As the Roaring Twenties gave way to the Great Depression, Luciano would face new challenges that would test the limits of his power and influence. Chapter 3 of The Rise and Fall of Lucky Luciano Chronicles The Pivotal Years of the Prohibition Era where Luciano's criminal genius and ruthless ambition propelled him to the top of the underworld. Chapter explores the young upstart's ability to adapt and innovate, his strategic maneuverings to eliminate his rivals, and the lasting impact of his restructuring of organized crime in America. As the stage is set for Luciano's eventual downfall, the reader is left with a sense of the extraordinary rise and the looming fall of this criminal mastermind. Chapter 4 the Commission, a new order. The Warring Twenties had seen lucky Luciano's power and influence grow exponentially. Through his savvy business acumen, strategic alliances, and ruthless ambition, he had become one of the most formidable figures in New York's criminal figures in New York's criminal underworld. However, Luciano's ascent to the top was not without its challenges, as he faced off against the old guard of the Mafia, the so-called Mustache Peets who clung to the traditional ways of the past. Tensions had been brewing for years between Luciano and the established Mafia families, led by the likes of Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. These seasoned mobsters viewed Luciano and his younger associates as upstarts who threatened their hold on power. Luciano, in turn, saw their rigid adherence to old-world customs and unwillingness to adapt as a hindrance to the growth and efficiency of their criminal enterprises. The turning point came in 1931, when Luciano orchestrated a bold and ruthless plan to eliminate his rivals. In a series of carefully orchestrated assassinations, 
He first targeted Massassinations. He first targeted Masseria, luring the aging boss to a meeting under the pretense of negotiating a truce. There, Luciano's men gunned down Masseria, effectively removing one of the last vestiges of the old Mafia leadership. With Masseria out of the way, Luciano then turned his attention to Maranzano, who had attempted to assert his dominance in the aftermath of Masseria's death. Maranzano, a cunning and calculating mobster, had tried to position himself as the new boss of bosses, a title he believed rightfully belonged to him. However, Luciano was not about to let anyone stand in the way of his ambitions. Through a combination of strategic planning and sheer audacity, Luciano arranged for Maranzano's assassination as well. In September 1931, Maranzano was gunned down in his office, marking the end of the old guard and the rise of Luciano's new order. With his rivals eliminated, Luciano set about restructuring the criminal landscape in New York City. Drawing inspiration from the corporate world, he established the Commission, a governing body that would oversee and coordinate the activities of the various Mafia families operating in the region. This innovative approach to organized crime was a stark departure from the traditional, decentralized structure that had dominated the Mafia for decades. Under Luciano's leadership, the Commission brought a new level of efficiency and professionalism to the criminal underworld. Gone were the days of turf wars and infighting, replaced by a more streamlined and strategic approach to managing illegal operations. Luciano recognized that in order to maximize profits and minimize risks, the Mafia families needed to work together rather than against one another. To this end, Luciano divided the New York criminal landscape into five distinct families, each with its own sphere of influence and responsibilities. These five families, the Genovese, Gambino, Luches, Bonanno, and Colombo crime families, would operate under the oversight of the Commission, which would serve as a governing body to resolve disputes, allocate resolve disputes, allocate resources, and coordinate large-scale criminal activities. Luciano's vision for this new Mafia structure was rooted in his understanding of the changing nature of organized crime in America. He recognized that the old ways of doing business were no longer sustainable and that the Mafia needed to adapt to the rapidly evolving social, economic, and political landscape of the 1930s. Gone were the days of the romantic swashbuckling mobster, Luciano ushered in a new era of professionalism and efficiency, where criminal enterprises were run with the same level of sophistication and strategic planning as any legitimate business. He surrounded himself with trusted lieutenants like Frank Costello and Mayor Lansky, who shared his vision for a more organized and streamlined criminal empire. Under Luciano's leadership, the five families expanded their criminal operations beyond the traditional realms of bootlegging and extortion. They diversified into lucrative ventures such as gambling, loan sharking, and drug trafficking, all while maintaining a tight grip on their respective territories. The Commission provided a framework for coordinating these activities, ensuring that each family had a stake in the overall success of the criminal enterprise. Luciano's ability to adapt and innovate in the face of changing circumstances was a key factor in his rise to power. As the Prohibition era came to a close, he recognized the need to pivot and find new revenue streams to sustain the Mafia's operations. By embracing a more corporate-like structure and diversifying their criminal portfolio, Luciano and his associates were able to maintain their dominance in the underworld even as the legal landscape shifted around them. However, Luciano's success did not go unnoticed by law enforcement and government officials. The growing power and influence of the Mafia, particularly under Luciano's leadership, began to draw increased scrutiny from authorities who were determined to dismantle the criminal empire. Luciano's ability to navigate these challenges and maintain his position at the top of the criminal hierarchy would be tested in the years to come, as the forces of law and order sought to bring him down. Chapter 5. The Fall from Grace The 1930s marked 
the pinnacle of Lucky Luciano's reign over the New York underworld. His carefully constructed criminal empire had expanded into a vast network of bootlegging, gambling, and extortion operations. Luciano's influence stretched far beyond the borders of the city as he forged alliances with powerful figures in the Mafia and the world of legitimate business. Yet, as Luciano's power grew, so did the scrutiny of law enforcement. Thomas E. Dewey, a young and ambitious prosecutor, had set his sights on dismantling the criminal infrastructure that Luciano had spent years building. Dewey was determined to expose the corruption that had taken root in the city, and Luciano would become his primary target. The investigation began with Luciano's involvement in a vast prostitution ring that had been operating in New York for years. Luciano had recognized the lucrative potential of the sex trade and had used his connections to establish a network of brothels and call girls that catered to the city's elite. The operation was meticulously organized, with Luciano overseeing the recruitment, transportation, and management of the women involved. Dewey's team of investigators worked tirelessly, gathering evidence and building a case against Luciano and his associates. They interviewed dozens of witnesses, pored over financial records, and conducted surveillance operations to uncover the extent of the criminal enterprise. The investigation was a complex and painstaking process, but Dewey was determined to bring Luciano down. As the investigation progressed, Luciano grew increasingly concerned about the threat posed by Dewey and his team. He knew that his carefully constructed criminal empire was in jeopardy, and he was determined to do whatever it took to protect his interests. Luciano's allies in the Mafia and the world of legitimate business were also deeply concerned, as they recognized that Luciano's downfall could have far-reaching consequences for the entire criminal underworld. In 1936, Luciano's worst fears were realized when he was arrested and charged with multiple counts of prostitution and racketeering. The trial that followed was a media spectacle, with Dewey using the opportunity to showcase his skills as a prosecutor and to publicly denounce the corruption that had infiltrated the city's institutions. Luciano's defense team mounted a vigorous defense, arguing that the charges were politically motivated and that Dewey was more interested in grandstanding than in pursuing justice. They pointed to the lack of direct evidence linking Luciano to the specific crimes he was accused of, and they attacked the credibility of the witnesses who had testified against him. However, the weight of the evidence against Luciano was overwhelming, and the jury ultimately found him guilty on multiple counts. The judge sentenced him to a staggering 30 to 50 years in prison, a punishment that effectively ended Luciano's reign as the boss of bosses. As Luciano was led away in handcuffs, he could not help but reflect on the irony of his situation. He had risen from the poverty of his immigrant roots to become one of the most powerful and influential figures in the criminal underworld, only to have it all taken away in a single moment. The downfall of Lucky Luciano was a stark reminder of the fragility of power and the consequences of unchecked ambition. In the aftermath of the trial, Luciano's criminal empire began to crumble. His allies and associates scrambled to fill the power vacuum left by his absence, leading to a series of violent power struggles and internal conflicts that further destabilized the Mafia's operations. Luciano's once formidable influence began to wane as new leaders emerged and sought to assert their own dominance over the criminal landscape. From his prison cell, Luciano watched helplessly as the empire he had worked so hard to build began to unravel. He knew that his days as the boss of bosses were over, and that his legacy would be forever tarnished by the scandal and disgrace of his conviction. Yet, even in the face of his downfall, Luciano refused to give up determined to find a way to regain his power and influence from behind bars. As the years passed, Luciano's imprisonment became a source of both frustration and opportunity. He continued to direct his criminal operations from within the confines of his cell, using a network of trusted associates to carry out his orders and maintain his hold on the underworld. 
At the same time, Luciano began to explore other avenues for regaining his freedom, seeking to leverage his connections and influence to secure an early release. The fall of Lucky Luciano was a dramatic and captivating chapter in the annals of American organized crime. It marked the end of an era as the old guard of Mafia leadership gave way to a new generation of criminal innovators who would forever change the face of the underworld. Luciano's story serves as a cautionary tale, a reminder of the perils of unchecked ambition and the fragility of power in the world of organized crime. Chapter 6 Behind Bars The Puppet Master As the heavy iron door clanged shut behind him, Luciano felt a chill run down his spine. The familiar sights and sounds of Sing Sing prison, the echoing footsteps, the clanking of keys, the barred windows, were a far cry from the lavish speakeasies and penthouse suits he had grown accustomed to. This was his new reality, a consequence of the downfall he had so carefully orchestrated. Luciano's reign as the boss of bosses had come to an abrupt end. His conviction on prostitution charges and subsequent 30-50 year sentence marked the culmination of a relentless crusade by prosecutor Thomas E. Dewey to dismantle the Mafia's grip on New York City. As he was escorted to his cell, Luciano couldn't help but reflect on the series of events that had led him to this moment. Despite the dramatic turn of events, Luciano refused to relinquish control of his criminal empire. From behind the prison walls, he would continue to pull the strings, maintaining his influence over the five families and the commission he had so meticulously crafted. It would require an entirely new set of skills and strategies, but Luciano was determined to remain the puppet master, even from the confines of his cell. In the early years of his incarceration, Luciano had to adapt to the harsh realities of prison life. Gone were the lavish suits and fine dining. Instead, he found himself in a world of inmate hierarchies, violence, and limited resources. But Luciano's cunning mind and knack for organization proved invaluable, and he quickly established himself as a respected figure within the prison population. Recognizing the potential value of his connections and expertise, Luciano began to leverage his position to maintain control over his criminal operations. He communicated with his trusted lieutenants, Frank Costello and Mayor Lansky, through an intricate network of intermediaries and coded messages. Together, they devised strategies to keep the five families functioning smoothly, ensuring the flow of revenue and the resolution of any conflicts that threatened to disrupt the delicate balance of power. Luciano's ability to adapt to his new circumstances was truly remarkable. He transformed his cell into a makeshift command center, using smuggled in contraband to stay informed and issue directives. Visitors, both authorized and surreptitious, provided him with the latest intelligence and updates from the outside world. Luciano's influence extended far beyond the prison walls, as his trusted lieutenants carried out his orders with the precision of a well-oiled machine. As the years passed, Luciano's incarceration coincided with a significant shift in the criminal landscape. The outbreak of World War I, I presented both challenges and opportunities for organized crime. With the United States' entry into the war, the demand for certain illicit goods and services increased, and Luciano's criminal empire proved resilient in the face of these new realities. Recognizing the potential value of Luciano's connections and knowledge, the U.S. government approached him with an unexpected proposal. They sought his assistance in disrupting Axis, aligned activities and protecting vital maritime operations, particularly around the port of New York. Luciano, ever the pragmatist, saw this as an opportunity to potentially secure his early release, and he readily agreed to cooperate. The resulting partnership, known as Operation Underworld, proved to be a complex and controversial arrangement. Luciano provided intelligence and facilitated the recruitment of convicts and mobsters to safeguard the docks, while the government turned a blind eye to his continued criminal activities. It was a delicate dance, with both sides carefully navigating the murky waters of this unlikely alliance. As the war progressed, 
Luciano's value to the government only increased. His extensive network of contacts and intimate knowledge of the criminal underworld proved invaluable in carrying out various covert operations. The government, in turn, began to explore the possibility of Luciano's early release, recognizing the potential benefits of having him on their side. Negotiations for Luciano's release were tense and protracted, with both sides jockeying for the best possible outcome. Luciano's supporters argued that his cooperation had been instrumental in safeguarding vital wartime operations, while his detractors vehemently opposed the idea of releasing a notorious criminal. In the end, Luciano's fate hung in the balance. As the government weighed the potential risks and rewards of this unprecedented arrangement. As the chapter draws to a close, Luciano sits in his cell, contemplating the twists and turns that have brought him to this point. From his humble beginnings as an immigrant on the streets of New York to his rise as the undisputed boss of bosses, Luciano's life has been a study in the pursuit of power and the consequences of ambition. Now, as he awaits the outcome of the government's deliberations, he knows that his future, and perhaps the very shape of organized crime in America, hangs in the balance. Chapter 7. Exile and Reinvention As the heavy iron gates of Danamora Prison slammed shut behind him, Lucky Luciano took a deep breath of freedom. It was 1946, and after a decade behind bars, the once formidable Mafia boss had finally regained his liberty. However, the terms of his release were far from ideal. Luciano was being deported to Italy, effectively exiled from the country he had once sought to conquer. Stepping out onto the docks of Naples, Luciano surveyed the unfamiliar landscape with a mixture of trepidation and determination. This was not the homecoming he had envisioned. His vast criminal empire meticulously constructed over decades, now lay thousands of miles away under the shaky control of his lieutenants. Luciano knew that reclaiming his throne would be an uphill battle, but he was never one to back down from a challenge. In the bustling streets of Naples, Luciano set about rebuilding his connections and forging new alliances. With his vast wealth and reputation as the former boss of bosses, he was able to command respect and influence within the Italian underworld. However, the landscape had shifted during his absence, and he found himself navigating an intricate web of familial rivalries and shifting allegiances. Undeterred, Luciano began to lay the groundwork for his return to power. He established base of operations in the city, using his contacts to funnel funds and information back to his associates in New York. Carefully, he began to reassert his control over the far-flung tentacles of his criminal empire, using a combination of bribery, blackmail, and the occasional well-placed threat. Yet, even as Luciano's influence began to grow, he found himself increasingly at odds with the U.S. government. The authorities, determined to keep the notorious mobster from regaining his former power, mounted a relentless campaign to undermine his efforts. Diplomatic pressure, Surveillance and the ever-present threat of retaliation made Luciano's life in exile a constant struggle. Undeterred, Luciano turned his attention to Cuba, a tropical haven that had long served as a haven for organized crime. Here, he saw an opportunity to establish a new power base, one that would allow him to maintain a degree of control over his American operations. Forging alliances with Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista and other influential figures, Luciano set about building an empire of casinos, hotels, and other illicit enterprises. The Havana Conference, a high-stakes gathering of mafia leaders from across the United States, became Luciano's crowning achievement in this new chapter of his life. Convening in the opulent Nacional Hotel, the assembled mobsters discussed the future of organized crime, with Luciano at the center of the discussions. It was a last-ditch effort to consolidate his power and regain his rightful place as the boss of bosses. However, the conference proved to be a double-edged sword for Luciano. While he was able to maintain a degree of influence over his American associates, 
The attention it drew from law enforcement and government officials only served to intensify the pressure on him. Suddenly, the walls were closing in, and Luciano found himself once again at the mercy of forces beyond his control. Forced to abandon his Cuban operations, Luciano returned to Italy, his dreams of reclaiming his former glory slipping through his fingers. The years in exile had taken a toll, both physically and mentally. The once formidable mafia kingpin found himself increasingly isolated and marginalized, his influence waning as a new generation of criminal leaders rose to prominence. In the final years of his life, Luciano found himself reflecting on the choices that had led him to this point. The pursuit of power and wealth had come at a heavy price, and as he contemplated his legacy, he was forced to confront the harsh realities of the life he had chosen. The immigrant who had once chased the American dream had instead become a cautionary tale, a reminder of the dark impulses that could lurk beneath the surface of even the most ambitious of men. On the streets of Naples, Luciano's name still carried weight, a testament to the indelible mark he had left on the world of organized crime. But as he drew his final breaths, the once mighty lucky, Luciano knew that his reign had come to an end, a victim of his own hubris and the relentless march of time. Chapter 8. The Long Arm of the Law As Lucky Luciano's release from prison in 1946 drew near, a sense of both anticipation and trepidation hung in the air. The criminal mastermind had spent a decade behind bars, watching his empire from afar as a puppet master, pulling the strings. But with his newfound freedom, Luciano faced a daunting challenge, regaining control of his criminal network in the face of increasing pressure from the U.S. government. Luciano's deportation to Italy was a bitter pill to swallow a harsh reality imposed upon him as the price for his early release. Arriving in Naples, he was greeted not with the fanfare of a returning hero, but with the skepticism of a man whose influence was waning. The American authorities had made it clear that they would be keeping a close eye on his every move, determined to prevent him from reasserting his dominance over organized crime on U.S. soil. Undeterred, Luciano set to work tapping into his extensive network of contacts and resources to begin rebuilding his criminal empire. He established a base of operations in Italy, but his sights were set on Cuba, a location that had long been a hub for his illicit activities. Luciano recognized that the island nation, with its lax enforcement and corrupt officials, offered him the best chance to regain a foothold in the criminal underworld. The Havana Conference a high-profile gathering of Mafia leaders from across the United States and beyond was Luciano's last-ditch attempt to consolidate his power. Held in 1946, the meeting was a bold move to assert his authority and coordinate the activities of his far-flung criminal enterprises. But the event was also a testament to the changing times, as Luciano found himself increasingly isolated and his influence diminished. The U.S. government, alerted to Luciano's activities, put immense pressure on the Cuban authorities to shut down the conference and expel the Mafia kingpin. Faced with this mounting international pressure, Luciano's dream of reclaiming his former glory began to crumble. The Havana conference ended in disarray, and Luciano was forced to retreat, his ambitions thwarted by the long arm of the law. Back in Italy... Luciano found himself increasingly marginalized, his once formidable criminal network slipping through his fingers. The new generation of Mafia leaders, empowered by the changing landscape of organized crime, had little use for the aging ex-boss. Luciano's attempts to maintain relevance through book deals and media interviews were met with a mix of fascination and disdain as the public grappled with the complex legacy of the man once known as the boss of bosses. The toll of his years in exile began to weigh heavily on Luciano. His health, both physical and mental, deteriorated as he struggled to come to terms with his diminished status and the fading of his criminal empire. The man who had once commanded the fear and respect of the underworld 
now found himself a relic of a bygone era, a cautionary tale of the consequences of unchecked ambition and the relentless pursuit of power. As Luciano's final years drew to a close, he found himself reflecting on the choices that had shaped his life, the triumphs and tragedies that had defined his legacy. The immigrant who had once chased the American dream had instead become a symbol of its darkest excesses, a man whose name would forever be synonymous with the ruthless world of organized crime. On January 26, 1962, Lucky Luciano's long and tumultuous journey came to an end. He died of a heart attack in Naples. His legacy, a complex tapestry of ambition, innovation, and the ultimate downfall of a criminal mastermind. The passing of the boss of bosses marked the end of an era, a moment when the curtain fell on one of the most influential and notorious figures in the history of American organized crime. Chapter 9. The Final Chapter As the sun set over the Bay of Naples, casting an amber glow over the ancient city, Lucky Luciano sat alone on the balcony of his modest apartment, lost in contemplation. The once feared mafia kingpin was now a mere shadow of his former self, his health failing and his influence all but extinguished. Luciano had spent the last decade of his life in exile, a far cry from the days when he had commanded the respect and fear of the criminal underworld. His attempts to maintain control over his American operations from abroad had proved increasingly futile as a new generation of mobsters rose to power in his absence. The Havana Conference, his last-ditch effort to consolidate his power, had been a disappointment. The meeting of Mafia leaders had descended into chaos, with Luciano unable to assert his authority as he once had. The writing was on the wall, his reign as the boss of bosses was over. As he gazed out at the bustling streets below, Luciano reflected on the long, winding path that had brought him to this point. From a young immigrant boy, struggling to survive in the tenements of New York's Lower East Side, to the most powerful criminal mastermind in the United States, his life had been a roller coaster of ambition, ruthlessness, and ultimately, downfall. The memories of his rise to power, the creation of the Commission, and the restructuring of the Mafia into the infamous Five Families still lingered in his mind. He had been a visionary, a pragmatist who recognized the need for a more organized and efficient criminal enterprise. But his thirst for power and wealth had blinded him to the consequences of his actions. Luciano's conviction on prostitution charges in 1936 had been the beginning of the end. Though he had maintained control from behind bars, the loss of his freedom had taken a toll, both physically and mentally. His release and deportation to Italy in 1946 had been bittersweet, a chance at a new life, but one stripped of the power and influence he had once wielded. In the years that followed, Luciano had tried to regain his foothold, operating from Cuba and forging new alliances. But the long arm of the law, both American and Italian, had relentlessly pursued him, chipping away at his criminal empire. The pressure had become too much, forcing him back to Italy, where he would spend the remainder of his days. As the evening chill set in, Luciano shivered, both from the cold and the weight of his memories. He had once been a titan, a criminal innovator who had left an indelible mark on the landscape of organized crime in America. But now he was just an old man, his glory days long behind him. Luciano's thoughts turned to his legacy, the impact he had made on the Mafia and the criminal underworld. He knew that his name would live on, his story immortalized in books, films, and the whispered legends of the streets. But he also knew that his legacy was a double-edged sword, a testament to the dark side of the American dream. With a heavy sigh, Luciano rose from his chair and made his way back inside, his steps slow and labored. The final chapter of his life was drawing to a close, and he could feel the weight of his mortality pressing down upon him. As he settled into his bed, Luciano closed his eyes, his mind drifting back to the distant past, to the days when he had been the undisputed king of the criminal empire. 
In the end, Lucky Luciano's story was not one of triumph, but of the tragic consequences of unchecked ambition and the relentless pursuit of power. His life had been a cautionary tale, a reminder that even the mightiest of empires can crumble in the face of the unforgiving forces of justice and fate. Chapter 10. The Luciano Legacy As the curtain fell on lucky Luciano's tumultuous life, the profound impact of his criminal empire continued to reverberate through the shadowy world of organized crime in America. Though his reign as the boss of bosses had ended in disgrace, Luciano's legacy lived on, shaping the very structure and operations of the Mafia for generations to come. In the years after Luciano's death in 1962, criminologists and historians began to fully appreciate the extent of his influence on the criminal underworld. The model he had established, the Commission and the Five Families, had become the standard blueprint for organized crime in the United States, a testament to Luciano's visionary thinking and ruthlessly efficient approach. Luciano was a true innovator, remarked renowned criminologist Dr. Maria Russo. He recognized the need for a more centralized and corporatized system of criminal enterprises, and he implemented it with a level of sophistication that was unprecedented in the history of the American Mafia. Under Luciano's leadership, the various crime families in New York had been reorganized into a cohesive network, each with its own defined territory and sphere of influence. This new structure not only minimized internal conflicts, but also allowed for a more strategic allocation of resources and a more effective coordination of illicit activities. The Commission served as a board of directors, if you will, overseeing the operations of the five families, explained historian Dr. James Finley. Luciano understood that by establishing this hierarchical system, he could maximize profits, reduce infighting, and project an image of unity and strength to both law enforcement and rival organizations. This centralized model proved remarkably resilient, withstanding the test of time and the numerous challenges posed by law enforcement crackdowns and internal power struggles. Even as new generations of Mafia leaders rose and fell, the basic structure that Luciano had put in place remained largely intact, ensuring the continued dominance of organized crime in the United States. Luciano's legacy is not one of individual success, but of systemic change, said Dr. Russo. He didn't just become a powerful figure within the Mafia. He fundamentally reshaped the way the entire criminal enterprise operated, making it more efficient, more adaptable, and more difficult to dismantle. The impact of Luciano's innovations extended beyond the borders of the United States as well. As his influence spread to other parts of the world, the Luciano model was adopted by criminal organizations in Europe, Asia, and South America, further solidifying his status as a towering figure in the annals of organized crime. Luciano's vision was truly global in scope, noted Dr. Finley. He recognized the potential for international cooperation and the benefits of sharing resources and expertise across borders. This allowed the Mafia to expand its reach and diversify its operations in ways that had never been seen before. However, Luciano's legacy was not without its darker shades. The very efficiency and success of his criminal enterprise came at a heavy cost, both in terms of human lives and the societal damage inflicted by the Mafia's activities. The ruthless elimination of rivals, the exploitation of vulnerable communities, and the corrupting influence of Mafia money all left indelible scars on the fabric of American society. We cannot ignore the human toll of Luciano's actions, said Dr. Russo. The violence, the extortion, the destruction of lives, all of this was a direct consequence of the system he put in place. His legacy is a complex and often disturbing one, and we must confront that reality head on. As the decades passed, the romanticized image of Luciano as a suave, charismatic figure often overshadowed the grim realities of his criminal legacy. Hollywood films, sensationalized biographies, 
and a growing public fascination with the Mafia mythos contributed to the lionization of Luciano, obscuring the true nature of his impact. There's no denying the allure of the Luciano story, acknowledged Dr. Finley. The rags, to riches narrative, the ruthless ambition, the rise and fall, it's the stuff of great drama, but we have to be careful not to let that overshadow the very real harm that was done, both to individuals and to society as a whole. In the modern era, the battle against organized crime continues, with law enforcement and government agencies employing increasingly sophisticated tactics to dismantle the Mafia's operations. Yet, the legacy of Lucky Luciano remains a formidable challenge, as the criminal structures he helped establish continue to adapt and evolve, often staying one step ahead of the authorities. Luciano's vision was so powerful and enduring because it addressed a fundamental need within the criminal underworld, said Dr. Russo. As long as there is a demand for illicit goods and services, and as long as there are individuals willing to exploit that demand, the Luciano model will continue to be a force to be reckoned with. As we conclude our journey through the life and legacy of Lucky Luciano, we're left with a complex tapestry of ambition, innovation, and moral ambiguity. His story serves as a stark reminder of the dark underbelly, of the dark underbelly of the American dream and the enduring allure of the criminal world. We hope you found this exploration of Luciano's life as fascinating as we have. If you've enjoyed this deep dive into the world of organized crime, please consider subscribing to our channel for more historical insights. Don't forget to like this video and share it with friends who might be interested in this captivating slice of American history. We'd love to hear your thoughts on Lucky Luciano and his impact on organized crime. Drop a comment below with your insights or questions. Your engagement helps us create content that resonates with our audience. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the rise and fall of the American Godfather. Until next time, keep exploring the hidden corners of history.